My name's Anthony Padilla, and today I'm gonna be sitting down with plane crash survivors to learn what it's really like to live through such a harrowing and torturous experience. Were these plane crash survivors able to emerge from this horrifying experience completely unscathed with a newfound drive and appreciation for life? Or do they live every day deeply scarred by the memories ingrained within them after surviving such a traumatic and unthinkable nightmare? Hello, Wendy. Hi, Anthony. Annette. Hello, how are you? Can you give us some backstory leading up to the plane ride itself? In 1992, with my fiance in Vietnam, he had planned this very romantic vacation on the South China Sea. We left at 7 a.m. I see that plane and I say, no, there's no way I go in there. Is it like a tiny plane? So small and I am a claustrophobic. So yeah. he said, yeah, I know, but please do it for us. And uh, it's only 20 minutes, you can do it. We're going to this most romantic place. I've booked everything, please, please, please try. Okay. I sat next to him, the third row, yeah. 31 people on board. I could almost hit the ceiling with my head. So I did not put on my seatbelt. Then took off. I looked at his watch. I was counting the minutes. This was the only thing I was doing. And then 20 minutes, I said, all right, okay, let's not happening. And then we just kept on flying. And he said, well, I knew I had to tell you, I'd be, I had to get you into the plane, but it is actually 50 or 60 minutes. 50th minute, you make a giant, a rather large drop. People were screaming already. And I said, well, a shitty little plane like that will feel if you have an air pocket, of course. So don't right. worry, don't don't worry. So then I, I softened up and said, it's, don't be afraid. Really? <laughs> you were comforting him and at that point? Of course, because the end was near at that point. So I was already getting relieved that we were almost there. Then another drop. People really screaming loud. Accelerating engines again. Another drop. He looks at me really scared. I look at him. He reached for my hand, I reached for his, everything goes black. August 2nd, 1985, I had been flying for six months for Delta Airlines. Left Fort Lauderdale and we were headed to Dallas. We took off, no problem. We had a little turbulence going into uh, Dallas. We were preparing for a landing and um, it was starting to get rough. It was a bad mm. thunderstorm. Did you start to get nervous at all about the turbulence? We were going side to side and then there were drops. Right, you know that drop. Yeah. Our perception because of TV movies is, oh, people are gonna be like, ah! It wasn't like that at all. People were very quiet. It's almost like people are holding their breath rather than letting it out. Now we're on airport property and we hit a big water tower and that caused the plane to explode. Oh man. So the part of the plane that I was on, the, the, where the survivors were, basically sheared off from the rest of the plane, but that's because the rest of the plane exploded. Were the pilots saying anything? Was there any kind of indication before it just kind of went black? Was there any indication that something was very wrong? No, not at all. It came out of nowhere and I didn't see storms or rain and, and there was of course all this. The plane was completely off track. And then what happened is we bumped into a mountain. The plane lost one wing, accelerated into the next mountain where it went upside down and the cockpit broke off. And uh -huh. then next, I know, I wake up in the midst of chaos, pieces of the plane, and I saw the vegetation of the jungle. Uh -huh. So of course, you think, but where the f am I? Of course, that's, yeah. really, that, that's, that, that's, that's how you feel. And when we hit that water tower and the plane exploded, I saw a fireball coming down the aisle at me. So that's when I closed my eyes, because I thought, if I'm gonna burn to death, I didn't want to know. So you see just a, way, a wall of fire inching up toward you. Not yeah. even inching, it just felt like it was coming at warp speed. And then stopped. Felt like being in Space Mountain and Disney World because you could hear the metal, you could feel things kind of twisting, you could feel the heat coming at, at you, and then it stopped. There was something heavy on top of me and I pushed it away. That was a chair with a, a dead man in it, as it turned out. And then I looked at my left, and then I saw my fiance still strapped in his chair, and he was dead. Oh my God. So did you get to mourn in that moment, or were you just in survival no, mode? No, I must have gone into shock, because the next memory is outside 
on the on the jungle floor. I'm sitting on a thousand twigs and with all this vegetation. There was a wing of a plane and chairs. I had 12 fractures in my hips, two in my knee and a collapsed lung. But I was Ooh. sitting there and I looked down and I see this giant gaping wound on my on my um, shin. And I saw the, the bone, the blue bone sticking out and the big, big gaping hole in my knee. Of course, what happened is that I was not wearing my seatbelt. I was going like a lonely piece in a dryer. Yeah. Um, and then I landed underneath this chair of this other person. You have not adrenaline, of course, going through your body and, and the pain is, is somewhat right. muted. But what I was more focusing on is because there was a gentleman sitting next to me, a Vietnamese, um, yeah. who spoke English even. He's strapped in his seat. He's alive. He's alive, but at one point he, I saw him getting weaker and I asked him, please, please don't die, don't leave me alone. Let's go get some water or let's just look, go look in the plane, let's do something. Was he the only other person that was alive at that moment? Yeah, getting silent during the first day. And I think he died in the end of the first day, but at that moment when he died, I never had been so entirely alone. So then I calmed myself down and then I just said, okay, you are here. Is crude, but this is it. This is it. This is your reality. You have to accept this. One of the things you're supposed to say, which I did, was release your seatbelts, get up, get up. For lack of a better term, you just went into autopilot and, you know, said the things that you were supposed to say to help people survive. And then I was thinking, I need to get out. The last row of seats in the airplane, I used the headrest as more like a railing and then went out to the side of the plane and there was a lady face down in the mud because it was raining, right? Bad weather. and. So one of the things that we're trained to do as well is to shake and shout, are you all right? Are you all right? That's what you're supposed to say. The thing about the training is when we were in training, nobody ever said no. But that day, that woman said no. And 23-year-old selfish, self-centered me, I didn't know what to do. Did the safety demonstration that you gave at the beginning of the flight help in anyone's survival? I don't think that what I said mm -hmm. made a difference for anybody in the cabin. I believe it helped me to have a plan. I did not let my mind go in what if scenario, but then I looked at the right and then I saw maggots coming out of his eyes. Mm. And then I thought, this is the moment I really have to move away from him. And then I was going to make a fire with that lighter, but it was, everything was wet. Was it constantly raining or was it just kind of so much moisture in the air? Just before it got dark, it rained a little bit. I could stick out my tongue because I was uh, so thirsty, so yeah. thirsty. And I settled down next to the wing of the plane and there I have an open view. So I figured out maybe if they fly over here, they can see me, that was one. And then I was laying there and I looked at the wing of the plane that broken off. The insulation material was made of some kind of foam, crept into that insulation material. And then I made seven little balls out of that foam. And then it rained and they, I saw all my little balls suck up the water and then I gave myself every hour or so every day I could take a sip. So at first it seemed like it was a detriment to you that it was so rainy because you couldn't create fires, you couldn't create smoke signals, but then you were able to utilize that rain and survive. Yeah, it worked. I went back toward the crash site, which um, has its, you know, disadvantages, of course, of seeing um, people who didn't survive, people who died. And then looking for me, I was looking for the crew. I was looking for my people. Eventually found one other flight attendant and then she and I were placed in an ambulance and she was going like this and pulling at her hair. And she said, is your hair, is your hair doing that? I was going like this. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. And it wasn't, her hair had been singed. She had been so close to the fire and she had been burned in her, wow. in her hair. The next day, it felt like I'd been hit by a Mack truck. I didn't have any physical injuries other than, you know, just the impact of an airplane crash. No Completely burns. Completely unscathed. I mean, physically, I was gonna say not mentally. Physi mentally, yeah. I'm sure it's taking but a huge toll. Sadly, the scars that you can't see are those that, you know, I carry. You have to leave your mind out because your mind makes up stories. Stay open and listen to your instinct. And that's what I did. Eventually, of course, by day six, I'm really, I'm dying. Then 20 yards away from me, I see a man staring at me. And I just, I have to shake off my altered state of mind. Start screaming at him first in English and then in French and then in German and then in all kinds of, but he was just staring, staring at me like that. He would move 
a finger. It was just standing there. And then he left. So then I go back to sleep. And then the day, next day I woke up and there he is again. And then mm. he disappeared again. By the end of the next day, eight or ten men coming up, up the mountain. They carry bags and they come up to me. And one of them shows me the passenger list, and that's my name. He gives me a sip of water. Uh -huh. I will never, ever, ever forget the taste of that. He does no worse for that. Champagne doesn't cut it. No. <laughs> no. Better than champagne. They put me on a, on a canvas, and they bind it on a stick, and then they carried uh -huh. me out the jungle between the two of them, like a little piggy. <laughs> and they, You're you a know, little rotisserie. It was only in half an hour or so, because then it was already pitch dark. And then they set up a tent for them to sleep in, and they put me on two sticks. Whoa, <laughs> You're just, they just set up a little m mobile yes. hammock for you. Then they took me to a hospital in Ho Chi Minh City. Then they did some machine in to, to blow up my lung. In the moment I saw my mother, I almost died. Why, because your heart was just going through the roof? I surrendered, that's it. I didn't have to be tough anymore. How many people were on that flight and how many survived? There were 163 passengers and only 27 survivors. So you must have seen more people that did not survive on your way out. There were three crew, only three flight attendants who survived and everybody else perished. During those eight days, do you know if the news was reporting on you or if the plane was reported as missing? Everywhere, in all news, maybe international, and, and of course in the Netherlands, we, we, every day, every day, my face was this big on the TV, and then the families, they put already ads in the newspapers, that, like, mm. like we had died. So there, there were already obituaries out there for you? Yeah, that, of course, that's absurd. Like, it's only, only good stuff. You know? <laughs> like, of course, if you want something for your self-esteem, you should read your own obituaries. You yes. got to know what, yeah. how people wanted to memorialize you. Yes, yes. I wanted to go back to Vietnam because I wanted to write this book and see if everything was the way I saw it. So then I went back in 2006. Then they did arrange a crew that would take me up the mountain. And then we are on top of the mountain. And then I saw, the sun, I saw this man sitting on the stone exactly in the same manner as the orange man. Go, come down my spot. And I woke up to said, it's you. And then he was embarrassed. He said, yeah. So at the time, he had never seen a white person for before and never seen blue eyes. Uh. Somewhere in this tirade of, of for me getting his attention, I had taken off my hood. And that's when he realized that I was somewhat human. And that's when he decided to go and fetch his friends. Oh, at first he was staring in disbelief, almost like he was seeing some kind of ghost or spirit of some right. sort that had come right. out of this crash. And then when you revealed your head, your hair, he saw that you were in fact a person he should go tell someone. So I said, okay, I thought you thought I was a ghost. I thought you were a ghost for all those 30 years in between. It was in the middle of nowhere. It's just amazing wow. that he found me. Then I found out day six when the orange man ran down to tell the helicopter took off with eight doctors and nurses on board and it crashed. Wow, a rescue mission yeah. had went out. Yeah. And do you hold on to any kind of guilt for that knowing that more people died while while looking for any survivors. That's real guilt. But then I went back February 2014, and there was this woman who actually gave me a speech that she was not angry at me at all, that actually seeing me reminded her of her husband. In a way, by me being there and by my me writing my book, I kept their relatives alive. What do you think was the most difficult part about surviving after the crash? Dealing with Basically, why me? Mm. Why did I get to live? I think there were so many other more worthy people on that plane, right? Because I was a selfish, self-centered brat that walked onto that plane. Look at who you are today. You can't judge your life based on who you were at one given moment. I have tried, endeavored to um, live a life that would be worth somebody saying, well, I'm, I'm glad she lived. But then, about six months after that, I had I had a breakdown. Really? It all I, came to the surface? Yeah. You weren't able to suppress it anymore? It did. No, you were, I wasn't fine. Mm. I was fine until I wasn't fine. Do you have a fear of flying now? Um, yes, but I do it scared. Life is way too short. Do you feel like you're facing your fear each time you step foot on a plane? I do. But, you know, it finally dawned on me one time. I was like, all right, well, what's the worst that could happen? Well, I could die. But I know where I'm going today. 
so I'm not scared. I'm still not happy to fly, <laughs> but it's it's again it's more it's more the claustrophobia more than anything. It's just the right. idea of getting stuck. If you could erase your experience or your memory of this plane crash happening at all. Would you? Yeah, see, for me, it's such a dual question because then my fiance would not have died. You see, that's still always the first thing that I, I just, that he died in this life cannot be without pain. So you can't really get caught up in the, if that didn't happen, then this would have happened, and then I could have do this. Like, there's almost no point to getting trapped into that thought cycle. Well, I just stay in what's real. I mean, what's real is, it's, uh, it's stranger than fiction, definitely in my case. Mm -hmm. But it's just mm -hmm. what's real. I mean, what if scenarios don't don't bring you anything? If there's anyone watching who has a fear of flying themselves, is there anything that you want to say to them? My fears mainly are being not in control. Mm -hmm. When I realize that mm -hmm. really ultimately I'm not, and that life is too short, and that I really want to go places and be with people and so the benefits outweigh all the negative aspects to you. I I think so. I think so, except for that middle seat. <laughs> right, not worth it if you gotta sit in the middle. Should we really go back to having the middle seat? Mm, I really? think if COVID taught us one thing, it's no middle seats right? ever. Right, I'm just saying. Has your perception of life and death changed after surviving this experience? Before we continue learning about the world of surviving a plane crash, it felt almost orgasmic. Well, more than almost, like completely all consuming. So I'd also like to thank our sponsor BetterHelp for our continued partnership. I've been outspoken about how therapy has been really helpful for me, but therapy can be customized to whatever is right for you and can be really helpful in providing tools to help with motivation or feelings of depression, anxiety, stress, insecurity, or whatever else you might need. BetterHelp has been continuing to improve throughout the years and screens all therapists and ensures they have experience and are certified and licensed and provides customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your licensed therapist. So you don't have to even see anyone on camera or speak over the phone if that's not something that you're comfortable with. Therapy can be expensive and the price of finding a therapist you like and really click with can really start to get overwhelming, which is why BetterHelp offers a more affordable alternative to in-person therapy where you can start communicating with your your licensed therapist in less than 48 hours. So thanks again to BetterHelp, who are giving I Spend a Day with viewers and listeners 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Padilla. That's betterhelp.com slash Padilla. Now back to the world of surviving a plane crash. I had a beautiful unity experience. I don't know how, but I really did stay every moment in the moment. It was just mm. beautiful. It was love. It was just love for my family at first and love and plus first mind over matter. To, mm -hmm. to really focus on this beauty of this jungle, but then it became heart over mind. And I became the jungle and I became one with the jungle and I became, it was really a unity experience. I, I described it, um, you know what the French say, but le petit mot? I don't know what that means. That's orgasm in French. I like that. And I say that the big death feels like the little one. I mean, maybe it's different for girls, but it just does <laughs> like the little one. It felt almost orgasmic in that moment. Well, more than almost, like completely all-consuming. Wow. It was just beautiful, it was beautiful. All right, you got five seconds to shout out or promote anything you want directly in the camera, go. Shout out to Kendall Metafoda and Hadley Buklas and Leighton Fernsell. Check out my website if you want me to come speak to your group. I survived the jungle by observing as opposed to judging. So I think non-judgment can, can save your life. What I do like about Anthony Padilla is that he shines the light on, on other people than the standard and therefore makes them standard. Thank you, I really appreciate that. After spending the day with these plane crash survivors, I've come to understand just how much strength and resilience is required to come out of the other side of an experience like this. While it's certainly important to be prepared and cautious of situations life might throw our way, it's just as important to value each and every passing moment without the grips of fear and anxiety taking control of our entire psyche. It was also back then, this is how long ago it was, the smoking section. Oh, yeah, I've heard about that in ancient folklore. Right, ancient folklore, exactly. <laughs> right after we had to outrun the dinosaurs, <laughs> I found the people that were in the smoking section were a lot easier to please than some of the other passengers mm, on the plane. Because they're just high on fumes. Well, they were smoking and happy. They had a <laughs> nicotine fix. That's not the look. <laughs>